Okay, today I am very excited to speak to somebody. Um, I actually have gotten pinged from a number of you all, you all being my listeners, about talking to this particular person. His name's Brian Clevenger, and he is uh, noted as well as being notorious as the developer of the Absinthe Soft System. Um, I don't know about you, but for me, it's a integral part of my working environment, my musical working environment. It's an amazing piece of piece of software. And so I'm really excited to have Brian, Brian on board for uh, this interview. So with that, I'll shut up and we'll start talking to Brian. Hey, Brian, how are you today? Pretty good. Good to be here. Thank you so much for joining us. You're located in France, right? Yeah, that's right. Um, originally, I'm from Kansas, but I've lived in France since 1989. Oh, my goodness. So what uh, what is it that what is it that got you to move to France? Uh, my wife is French. Ah, I see. Okay. So um, we were living in a small town in Kansas, in Lawrence, Kansas, which yeah. was a nice place. But um, I don't know. It was just an adventure. Sure. We decided to move to Paris. Um, I was interested in earcom and all the electronic music stuff that was happening in France. So it was just an adventure, and we ended up settling here. So very interesting. So um, I kind of spilled the beans a little bit that that you are the developer of Absinthe, but why don't we have you describe what your current work is, with the kinds of things that you're doing right now? Current work, I'm I'm mostly doing kind of R and D exploratory type of work for future products. Okay. Um, possibly future Absinthe, maybe something else. Lately, I've been playing a lot with modal synthesis. I'm real interested in that. I don't know how much I should talk about um, specifically what I'm I'm doing because oh, that's well. Just I, I guess I'm mostly interested in just hearing that you're kind of on an R and D track because that's pretty exciting. Right. Those of us who are Absinthe fans, and I think that there are an extraordinary number of Absinthe fans out there, are all going to be really excited to hear that you remain active in R&D because yes. I think a lot of us really trust your vision for uh, synthesis. It's, it's, really, it's really cool. Now, I'm curious. One of the things I like doing in my podcast is talking to people about their background. And I'm curious, what is the track that you took that got you to the point of making absinthe it's a it's an amazing piece of work i'm wondering what your trek was to get there let's see uh well basically i have a composition degree i i'm a more of a musician than than a programmer by um uh, my education and my background but um uh, in the mid 90s you know when computers started getting fast enough to do real-time audio there wasn't a lot available. There was Super Collider, I remember, that I worked a lot with at the time. And one day I was, I was thinking about, you know, like the early history of Apple, when you had this potential for home computers that people didn't realize was a possibility yet, except for like hobbyists, you know, right. geeky people who just wanted to have a computer just to have a computer. Sure. Jobs and Wozniak had this this vision they realized you know there was this this potential and i was anyway i was thinking about that thinking about how you know what a rare opportunity that was and i realized well look now we can do real time audio on computers we can do real time synthesis but what we have is this you know hard to use not terribly practical um kind of academic types of programs Experiment and very interesting stuff too, but that's going to appeal to a limited number of musicians. Right. And so I realized, you know, this is this is the time. This is the time for me. I, I think I'd always wanted to design a synthesizer, and uh, I didn't have the engineering background and stuff. But I'd worked enough with computers, synthesis. I've worked a lot with Max. I I thought I could become a programmer. And so I thought, well, now's the time to try this, you know, see what I can do with it. And so I taught myself programming, uh, taught myself C and C++. And um, it took about three years for me to go from, you know, nothing to having uh, the first version of Absinthe, which I think was in 2000. And I originally released it as a shareware, and it was just a big hit. 
it happened at just the right time, I think. There were there were a few different products out, but they weren't either they were real limited or they were not terribly practical. It, it was kind of a weird period. I, I don't know if you remember what it was like then. VSTi uh, VST instruments wasn't really happening yet. There were a lot of standalone synthesis right. applications, right. which Absinthe yeah. was too. Yeah. Originally, it wasn't a plugin, and there was this transition, you know, from these standalone software synths to um, plugins that s some of the products didn't make it. And that was something we all went through. I mean, I think uh, Max MSP and Reactor and Absinthe, all, all, all of these these products started off as um, standalone. Absolutely. Anyway, it, w it was a time when I think people were just starting to understand that you could use the computer as a synthesizer use it as an instrument but people hadn't really seen very convincing products i think uh, with the exception of like a reactor and max msp i think but again those those are difficult programs to approach sure you know it, 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 you have to know a lot and i wanted to do something that was real flexible and real open but more direct than the uh totally modular approach yeah you know, where you're not working with, you know, real low level kinds of objects like multiplies and adds and <laughs> stuff like that. <laughs> you know, right. you're just you're just working with higher level types of objects with a lot of modulation possibilities. Yeah, well, it's it's interesting that you say it that way, because I think, you know, as someone who spent some time underneath the preset skin of Absinthe, what you have there is you have all the ha hallmarks of a sophisticated modular system, you've just kind of packaged it in a way that presents itself more like an instrument and less like a programming language, right? Yes, exactly. It's not a programming language, obviously, but it's uh, much more flexible than a you know traditional... Min Minimoog emulation, right? Right, exactly. You could say it's sort of in between a Minimoog and... Um, <laughs> Reactor. reactor. <laughs> <laughs> so um, I that's a very interesting history. First of all, that there are very few people for whom their first effort at making a product ends up taking them through their whole career. You know, <laughs> and that's kind of where you're it's, at. It yeah, I kind of won the lottery in, in a way. Yeah, <laughs> well, and the timing was right. Certainly, but that I think that was it. I think if it had happened. A few years later, you know, the market would have been pretty saturated. Right. Um, it wouldn't have gotten the attention it did. Yeah. Um, yeah. It, yeah, that's certainly true. So um, I have a couple of questions, though, uh, related to that. Along the way, in order to make, in order to be where you're at today, you had to make a lot of, not only have your timing be right, but you have to have made a lot of right decisions along the way, right? Right. So one, you know, one really important decision was to team up with Native Instruments, which was clearly, you know, a really big winner in terms of bringing it to a higher level market, right? Mm -hmm. That's um, that's right. That's. And uh, another another thing you had to decide was to embrace it being a plug-in device as opposed to just a standalone device. And then also what sort of like plugins to, to support. Cause you know, if we think back for those of us who are there, if we think back to 2000, nobody knew who was going to be the winner was, right. was Motu going to win with MAS right, was, that's right. was Steinberg going to win with, with VSTs. I was, think we had, you know, we had a mass version of absence. I think. Did you? I think <laughs> I can't even remember, but well, you're right. there were all the these plugin Tools formats thing. that yeah, don't crazy. exist now. Right, and if you would have put all your effort into one, or even worse, if you would have, you know, because I saw this where companies said, you know what, we're going to work really closely with, I don't know, we're going to work really closely with with the Pro Tools thing, and we're going to show up at all their events, and we're going to align ourselves very much with them and then they're like oh yeah you know what we don't really like this format we're gonna go with another format and they were left behind and so otherwise great technology was disappeared because it attached itself 
kind of to the wrong technology or the wrong partners. Right. And you actually really did a great job of making decisions. Well, that's okay. In terms of plug-in compatibility, that's that's in I side. Uh huh. And I'm not too terribly involved in that. So at this point, I, in the past, I used to have to deal more directly with plug-in stuff. But today, today I, don't, I, don't, I don't think about it. I, I don't do any, you know, I do very little plug-in specific development now. Sure, sure. But um, those, those were nice decisions, and they, they did a really great job. I, I think um, because it's it's a very difficult programming task. You know, you, you you have to support both Mac and Windows. Well, and you have to do it in a way that performs well too. Yeah, you have to do it in a way that performs well. You have to be able to support. At the time, you had to support Intel and also uh, Motorola's PowerPC right, right. Uh, processors. Okay, so you had these totally different kinds yeah. of processing environments. And of course, different operating systems, and each operating system had three or four plugin formats to support, right, right. which is a, a programming nightmare. It is. You know, it's I that mean, most evil matrix thing, right? Yeah. And Absinthe originally was on Mac and it was a standalone. So there was a kind of painful transition from that to doing something that could be portable, you know? Right. That, that was a very, very busy time in my life. <laughs> <laughs> So when was it that you joined forces with NI? I joined forces with NI in, it was officially announced at Music Mesa in 2001. Ah, oh, okay. I think. Um, that happened quite fast, actually. There, after I released the, uh, the shareware version, there were, there were a few people that were contacting me. I mean, a few different companies. I don't want to say who, but right. NI actually, a couple of guys, Mata Gallic, Mm -hmm. And um, Egbert Jurgens came to Paris and met me, and they were just really cool. Yeah. They were very open-minded. I, I felt that they trusted me as a, a developer, that, that they, they liked my ideas. Mm -hmm. And I felt that they would let me do more or less what I want and that they would contribute you know, good ideas on their side. So that was the re really what made me comfortable working with NI. Sure. Uh, I felt that they weren't going to try to change change it into a different kind of product or right. uh, simplify it or dumb it down. And I've been real happy with the relationship with NI over well, the years. Yeah, yeah, and rightfully so. I mean, they have always kind of kept Absinthe as sort of like a flagship synthesis product, which is great because, again, we're talking about now 15 years yeah. since, you, since you started working with them. I mean, it's great for them to have that kind of a history, that, that they're willing to, to stick with something for that long. Because there again, if, with computer products, sometimes they have a tendency to come and go too quickly. Right. And right. So that's, that's really neat. Well, when you, when you first started working with them, did they already have like this plug-in framework uh, in existence, uh, or was that something that you were developing with them? That, that's the something that kind of happened a little later I see so in the early years I actually was it didn't have quite as much plug-in support it was more like just VST and uh, I remember the Windows port being kind of an ordeal right being a Mac guy yeah. but um, yeah at that actually at the time I was I had more responsibility with the plug-in stuff I see but by absence 2 absence 2 and absence 3 it was really more on on their side um, and we had more plug-in support by, by that time. Sure. What I'm curious about is what led to you, you know, so, so you learned programming and you started uh, working on and eventually developing Absinthe, but you had to have something as a precursor to that. You said you have a composition degree um, and that you're more musician than programmer. What is... Where did you get your degree, and how did you move from there to saying, I have to be a programmer? Okay, so that's going way, way back. Right. The first, I, I, I'm a bass player. I'm an electric bass player. That's the only instrument I feel comfortable saying I'm pretty good at. I studied jazz for a while, and I was interested in avant-garde music, too. I mean, I, I, I have real diverse musical tastes. And uh, I was interested in studying composition. So I was, uh, I'm from Kansas, so I went to the University of Kansas. 
And uh, they had a nice electronic music studio based around an ARP um, 2500 mm -hmm. and a 2600. And there was also an AKS in the studio we got to play with sometimes. So as far as that, that was the, my first real experience with electronic music was working with the um, 2500 especially. I enjoyed it. I felt like I was good at it. But at the same time, this is weird to say because that's a kind of mythic sort of instrument right. <laughs> today, you know, right. the, like an ARP 2500, wow. Right. But at the time we were like, you know, this is 70s stuff. This was in right. the 80s. Right. We were like, uh, I, I was in, I went to digital. Yeah. You know, I was interested in digital stuff. I remember our composition teacher, he played me Paul Lansky's Six Fantasies. That was the first computer music I'd ever heard. And it was like something out of a dream. <laughs> you know, it didn't sound like anything I'd imagined before. And I was like, well, that's what I want to do. And where could you do that? There, <laughs> You know, I couldn't do it where I was. I was reading Computer Music Journal, and it would have these little floppy records. Right. <laughs> what do you call those? Yeah, like the I, sound sheets. Right, sound sheets. Yes. And there'd be like these sounds from like Earcom. These sounds that was like, wow, what is that? You I know, know. Right. Just, just really intriguing, but also inaccessible. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and especially especially being in the heartland. I mean, you were lucky in that you were in Lawrence, but even still, it's yeah. the middle of the country. There's stuff happening on the East Coast. There's stuff happening on the West Coast. And there's stuff right. happening in Europe, but not a whole lot of stuff really germinating out of the center of the U.S. No, no. I found myself in a similar place at a similar time. So mm. I guess I kind of uh, grew up in isolation from sure. The the real creative centers in in electronic music. Then I started working with the Yamaha stuff, and then by that point I was getting sounds I liked. I was able to work compositionally in a way that I liked, and I I really liked working with the FM systems. With the um, at home I had a they had this little computer, the CX5M. Right. right. If you remember that, yes, I had I one do. of those. Cool. And I spent so much time on that thing. I had that and a TX816. Right. No, TX81Z, what am I uh, saying? Okay, it's very um, different. <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah, but I did, I did work with the TX816 as well, um, okay. but it wasn't, wasn't mine. Uh, so anyway, I worked a lot with the Yamaha stuff, and I, I feel like that influenced me. I think the breakpoint envelopes, I, w I was kind of thinking like the DX7 or uh, the SY77. There, there was an idea I liked a lot in those synths, but it was real limited. Right. Well, and, and hard to visualize when you just yeah. had a bunch of numbers. Exactly. Right. You know, and that's one of the things I saw as being a big advantage of computers is you had this nice interface to work with, right. this nice visual interface. So you could do a lot of more visual-oriented things that were always very awkward with hardware <laughs> sense, like right. uh, drawing waveforms, for example. Absolutely. You know, right. that's, that was an idea that, that just intrigued me. You know, before I had access to any kind of digital system, seeing like a fair light when you could draw a waveform right. with a pin on the screen, that just seemed like the coolest thing. You know, and there were some hardware synths that tried to, to, to allow that, and it didn't, wasn't very practical. Right. And so those are the kinds of things that uh, I saw with computers as being a big advantage. Well, it's interesting, too, because these systems that you found yourself really familiar with, Actually, it's easy in that context to see where you got some of the focus for absinthe because, you know, first of all, uh, an ARP 2500 is very unique because instead of just being patch cord modulation routings, it had this whole kind of like slider switch modulation right. matrix, mm -hmm. which made it sort of a semi-patched modular. Right. right, right. There's a limited number of sliders right. and stuff. I mean, yeah, in, in a way, it's more limited than patch cords, but but at the same time, it again, it it sort of implies direction, right? Right. And and similarly, it's interesting to hear that the TX eighty one Z is something you had because I always found that of all of that earlier Yamaha stuff, I found that the most intriguing because first of all, it had waveforms other than sine waves right right i use that all the time yeah but also 
the routing, it had a little bit more flexibility in the routing and the algorithm use, as I recall, or like maybe it was like the boundaries of the modulations or whatever. But I found it to be incredibly interesting to program. Now, I never got good enough that I actually got the sounds that I liked, yeah. <laughs> like, you know, because it was really easy. It was really easy to go from a very pure bell sound to the the cat scratching the screen door, right? Right, exactly. But, and I have to say, I kind of enjoyed that experimentation, even if I didn't get really musical results. Mm -hmm. Well, one thing I always found with the FM synths, the way I viewed them is, of course, they didn't have any kind of resonant characteristics. They didn't have any filters. They didn't have built-in effects or anything like that. And I would almost systematically play it through something else, through some uh -huh. kind of effect processor. Uh, and I found that if I was playing it through some kind of dense reverb or something, I would create a, a totally different kind of sound than if I had been just listening directly to the output of the synth. And I would make a sound that worked with that reverb. See what I mean? Uh, that's actually... I, I, in a way, I, I thought of the <laughs> FM part as being like the string of a guitar, but without any kind of resonating body. Body. Right. It did. It didn't have a resonator, and that was what was missing. And so it would have to try different things, you know, to try to um, add that body to it. Yeah. So for you, the effects processor ended up as much of the sound design as the as the synthesis. Yeah. yeah. Now I I was working a lot with the FM. I mean, I was. I, it wasn't like I just slapped an effect right, on it. Right, it right. sounded good. <laughs> it was, but uh, to to me, the the effect was an integral part of of the sound as a resonator. Right. You know, I still kind of think in sounds in terms of like um, a source, something that generates the sound, mm -hmm. then a, a some kind of resonator, and then the space that the the, the instruments in. I tend to think of sounds in those three having these three parts so yeah the, the the fm synth really was just the first part it was a sound generator then it needed a resonator and then something to create a space well and again it points to what you ended up with absent because i think one of the things that you know now certainly i feel strongly when when i'm working with absent is that the sound programming really includes effects processing as an integral part of the yes. sound design Yes, and I don't really even think of it as effects so much. Right. I think of it it's it's just part of the instrument. Almost almost um, like alternative filters or something, right? Exactly. Right. Now it's it's interesting. I mean I mean delays can can cross this boundary between between pitch and time. You know, mm -hmm. the, it, if the delay is long enough, it's an echo, but as it gets shorter and shorter, it starts functioning as a filter or even as an oscillator. Right. And that's an interesting property of delays that I, I, I was always kind of fascinated with that. But I wanted the modulation of the effect to be part of the whole modulation system, you know, with the envelopes and stuff. Right. Instead of it being just its own little separate thing. And I, I didn't want to have effects that were real specific, like a flanger or a chorus right. or something. Right, something too prescriptive, right. Yeah, I want to just provide, these are all delays. So I'll have these different configurations of delays to have different properties and you you set it up to get the kind of sound you're interested in that's but yeah that's yeah I, I always saw it as, as being a real integral part of the patch and not just something to make it prettier or shine put a shine on it mm -hmm. you know there were for a long time there was kind of this shtick with hardware synths where the presets that you would get from with your synth and i'm sitting here looking at my old kurzweil and kurzweil was notorious for this which is in order to make it so that the presets would sound great at the music store, they would dredge <laughs> everything in reverb, even though it didn't actually make it musically better. It just happened to be that sounded better in the music store. Right, exactly. I, I understand why they would do that. <laughs> but, but that doesn't um, make you want to do it, right? And, and you know, with the hardware synth, it's, yeah, it's you know, different. there's more of an effort, you know, to add reverb to it. You need to have a separate reverb unit. Right. Maybe you want to use that reverb for something else. Yeah. So I guess it, you know, it makes sense. But for me, reverb, I'm thinking because I, I don't have an integrated reverb in Absinthe, right. really. 
I mean, I have some things that can get reverb like effects, but for proper reverb, I was thinking, you know, people are using this as a plug in, people have reverb already. Sure. <laughs> They've probably got their own favorite reverb, yeah, so exactly. I, I, it's not really something I need need to need, integrate. Yeah, you need to put your fingerprint on, right? Focus on other things. Sure. So one of the things that I'm curious about in your case is this idea that you felt like you were more musician than programmer. I'm curious to what extent that was a little nerve wracking. So like when you were first, when you took and you developed the first version of Absinthe and you threw it out there as shareware. And then also when you went and talked to Native Instruments and you were, you know, were presenting them with a body of code or whatever. Did you ever feel like, well, you know, I just kind of learned this on my own. And I hope <laughs> it's not embarrassing. Totally. Or uh, Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I, I mean, I think I'm an okay programmer now. Uh-huh. You know, I mean, I've learned over the years. But yeah, I'm, I was intimidated <laughs> in the beginning because, uh, you know, obviously I hadn't studied it in school or anything. Right. I felt kind of like you, you imagine being the guitarist in some band that becomes successful. And then you meet guitarists who are like session musicians, yeah. <laughs> you know, who are a lot better than you. <laughs> and you're like, well... Oh, man. <laughs> right, I'm, I'm just going to go hide for a while. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, there was some of that. But the, but they were really cool about it, too. I mean... Yeah, the the thing I'm, I'm curious about is the, the fact is, in order to make Absinthe work, I mean, certainly there's a lot of graphic design involved there and proper development of and, and performant creation of user interfaces is one set of things. But... The tools necessary to do DSP programming, especially musical DSP programming, that's still not something that they really actively teach in most universities anyway. No, and what they teach isn't really doesn't really apply so much to synths. Right. But you then know? also, yeah, it mostly applies to cell phones, right? Right. But also in 2000, there wasn't even enough of an of an internet backbone for you to necessarily find a lot of information there. So I'm curious about where did you go to find the stuff that says, here's how to do a digital oscillator. Here's how to do an anti-aliased oscillator. Here's how to do a decent sounding filter. Here's how to make it so that your modulation doesn't choke your CPU or whatever. Right. Well, there, there actually was quite a bit of stuff available on the internet, but it was harder to find at the time. But I found it. <laughs> you were Alta Vista's best user? <laughs> exactly. I forgot all about Alta Vista. Yeah. <laughs> well, I haven't gotten to use I that. haven't gotten to use that in five years, so I was happy to pull that one out of the hat. <laughs> <laughs> Actually the original absence, the very first version did not have anti aliasing. Oh, okay. Um, it was more like a DX7 in that sense. Right, right. And that was because all the DS, all the anti-aliasing strategies I found were just, just sounded horrible. Yeah. They sounded worse than the aliasing to me. Right. <laughs> um, I mean, some of the products that came out at the time, you know, it was, it was like, you imagine like key groups. I mean, the oscillator worked like key groups on a sampler, uh-huh. but, it, but the, the top end would be chopped off. Right. You know, so that you would have between, I don't know, 15K and 20K is chopped off. Right. And that creates this sound that I can't stand. Yeah. It's, it's like having an insect inside my ear or something. <laughs> um, I, I can't stand that sound. So I was like, well, the aliasing sounds better than that. Yeah, well, it's funny that you say that because that that's something I tend to think of it the way it doesn't sound like insects to me. What it sounds like to me is plastic. You yeah, it does. yeah, that's, uh-huh. And I remember the first time I heard it and was horrified by it was Steinberg put out some kind of, I don't even remember what the name of it was called. Maybe it was like Model E or something, but it was supposed to be a mini Moog like thing. Right. And they were kind of like bragging about how they had, you know, done a lot of work to make these rich and, and fat sounding oscillators. And I excitedly ran down to the store and plopped my money on the table and took it home and plugged it in and it felt like it was wrapped in saran wrap it was just <laughs> like it was like oh my god this is the most disappointing thing in the history of ever and so i i remember being really disappointed by that and and i agree there was 
if you enjoyed embracing the buzzy and kind of aggressive sound of aliased oscillators, mm-hmm. there was actually a lot of a lot of good stuff. And I mean, now now people like actively are looking for DX one hundreds or whatever specifically to be able to embrace that. Right. Well, you can still turn the anti aliasing off in absinthe. Uh-huh. Um, which I use when I'm making like noise sounds. Sure. You know, like of modulating a, modulating a real real bright waveform with no anti aliasing. Produce really interesting noise noise source that way. Sure. And you know, it's funny because the really old absinthe sounds. If you turn the anti aliasing off, they don't sound the same. Oh, really? So uh, that's that. That was actually the reason we left it in as a possibility was because the old sounds didn't sound didn't sound quite right. right. That's hilarious. <laughs> well, and, but that does bring bring up a point. Absence currently at version number five. How much of a weight is the history of patches and songs that people have created in absence? That actually kind of hamstrings you from making big changes. Huh, that's an interesting question, and that's kind of a question I think a lot about, actually. Yeah. Um, I mean, there there are things I would really like to change internally, and I think I can, and that would bring some big improvements. And I think I can do it by maintaining uh, pretty good compatibility with the past. Mm-hmm. At some point, we'll have to say this is you know the sounds are going to work maybe it won't be quite exactly the same. Right. At some point, I think we'll have to make that decision. Yeah, I, I, I don't know. I mean, it becomes a, a, a bit of a chore having to maintain compatibility modes and legacy right. modes and stuff. But um, it's not that big of a problem either. And, and I do want people to be able to preserve their sounds. I want to keep my sounds. Right. You know, I don't want to lose all the sounds I've made. Sure. I mean, originally I made absinthe because I wanted to... A synth that I wanted to use, so I, I don't want to. I don't want to lose my work. Right. Um, I don't want it to start sounding wrong. Yeah, that's that's an interesting thing to consider. Yeah. So, as a as a musician yourself, you obviously clearly you use absinthe for your own work. What are some other things that? Well, first of all, do you have any music of your own that's out there that people would be able to listen to? I'm sure people would be fascinated to hear what you've been doing. <laughs> Basically, all that's that's out there is, um, I mean, I'm not a successful musician, <laughs> <laughs> unfortunately. Um, I, I, I mean, there's my SoundCloud. There's some stuff on SoundCloud. Yeah. So give us a site right away so that we can we can get it there. It's it's just Brian Clevenger on SoundCloud. Um, it's mostly just kind of absinthe demos. Okay. I guess. Right. I mean, it. I, it's mostly these soundscapes I make with absinthe. Got it. But it's it's quite listenable, I think. Sure. You know? I, I mean, it's not just individual sounds. It's these these sounds that are these big evolving soundscapes, and I just put a chunk of it. Got it. Up, you know. So, do you do a lot of the preset development, or do you have other people helping you with that? Um, no, and I and I manages that. Uh, I see. Okay. I, I'll propose presets, but. It's just like everybody else. It's like all the other sound designers. Right. You know, I'll, I'll propose, I'll give them 20 presets and they'll use three of them or right. something. Has their preset developers ever surprised you by giving you something you didn't know was possible? Simon Stockhausen's sounds always really impressed me. Sure. I mean, there's a lot, <laughs> that, that, there are a number of times, I mean, especially with Simon's stuff, uh, or play the key and the sound comes out. I'm like, wow, how do you do that? <laughs> the other thing I was going to ask is, is besides absinthe, what are the things out there that you kind of love? The things I love, you mean like synths? Like, yeah, stuff? synths and stuff or, or effects or new hardware maybe. I don't know. What is when you play mm-hmm. music as opposed to programming music devices? What are things you like using? What are the things that kind of what fascinate I like you? Using? Well, I'm a bass player. Uh-huh. So... You know, there's bass gear. <laughs> as far as, at, at, seriously, as far as synths and stuff go, I just use absinthe. Okay. And I use um, contact when I need a sampler. Got it. It's it's kind of a discipline thing. I I, I always like to, even before absinthe, I, I preferred to have kind of a limited range of synths to work with. Yeah. And I felt like Yamaha synths 
I could do a lot with it. Right. Rather th rather than having a whole lot of gear that you don't know that well. Yeah. Like this synth gets a certain kind of sound, you know, it's got a certain preset and you like it because of that. Right. I prefer to have maybe one instrument that I know really, really well. Well, it's interesting you bring that up though, because that's <clears> kind of like one of my shticks, which is that it takes a long time to get facility. I mean, if we think about software as being really instruments rather than just a disposable preset machine, mm -hmm. you know, whether you're talking about hardware or software, it actually takes a long time, even if you're good with the interface, if you're good with a keyboard, or you're good with a set of pads, or you're good with a bass or a guitar or whatever, when you get a new instrument, a new a new implementation of an instrument, it takes a long time to get facility on it. But stuff is coming out so fast that it seems like it actually can be a little bit difficult to have enough time to be getting good at it right right and maybe right. this is one of the reasons why i feel so strongly that absinthe and its long history is so valuable is that it represents something that's been around long enough that it has a deep body of work and a deep a right. great number of adherents and a lot of people who've become who've gotten a lot of facility with it as an instrument right that's a good point that's a really good point. And, and so I'm always curious then when people have kind of this history of, of like developing or using something for a long period of time, what are some of the other things they they use? Because that to me kind of points to other things that might have that kind of history available. To oh, them. sure. I mean, certainly your, your discussion of the FM stuff, that is really pointed because FM programming kind of is hard making a mental image of what a FM patch is actually doing mm, mm -hmm. is kind of tough. And yeah. it's something that very few people are able to grind their way through. Yeah. I think that was more of a problem of the interfaces. Yeah, actually. maybe. Like I said, I, my first synth I had at home was this uh, CX-5 computer. Mm -hmm. Okay, so it had actually a pretty nice FM editor. It had, an, it had a nice program for, for making sounds that was way better than the DX7. Sure, sure. So I feel like that's one reason I got pretty good at it, because we had a decent interface instead of having to, you know, go through a bunch of little pages right, to access right. each parameter. Yeah, I hadn't thought about that uh -huh. as being the real value of the CX-5, but of course, that makes a lot of sense. Yeah, I, th I think it was good to learn on, at least. I mean, I mean there, there's a lot of interesting products around of course mm -hmm. one manufacturer i watch kind of closely is mutable instruments mm -hmm. i mean i don't i don't own any modular hardware but i think what he's doing is really really interesting yeah i was going to ask you to ask you if you were getting at all intrigued by the modular stuff because with your background you and i again kind of had have this uh experience of being surrounded by analog gear at a time when the digital gear was desirable. I happen to be going right. to North Texas when they were so anxious to sort of like remainder all of their own analog stuff because, hey, Synclaviers and, mm -hmm. you know, they had a PDP-11 sitting in the basement that they were using for, they were hand wiring cards for it. It was ridiculous. <laughs> but, um, you know, this stuff was coming along and it was going to change everything. And so the the 2600 and the, the TX 3340s got shoved in a basement room that I and all the other freshmen got to play in, right? Uh -huh. But I'm wondering, you know, for me, I always, because I learned synthesis on that, it's always been a thing that has called me back. Hmm. But it sounds like less so for you. Yeah, I'm. I kind of feel like, well, it's it's obviously evolved so much. Right. You know, it's so much better today than it was when we were, you know, working on the classic systems. Right. Right. I mean, there's so much more possibilities. I feel like, I, I I can't stand having an instrument in my house if I'm not really making music with it and really playing with it. Sure. You know, like if somebody gave me a mini Moog. I'd want to get rid of it because I wouldn't be doing anything with it. You know, right. I just noodle around with it once in a while. I, I admire how great it sounds. Maybe I'd study it a little, 
but I wouldn't be making music with it. Right. So I would want somebody else to have it. I'd feel guilty having having this great instrument that I'm not not really putting to good use. Right. I really like having everything in my computer. I I like having everything in my laptop. Having a real it's it's just so compact. Um so I'm not real tempted by it, but I'm I'm real curious about it as well. Sure. Well, I think also having come up during a time when a studio looked like a room, now having a studio mm. look like a hardcover book is there's a lot of there's a lot of new flexibility and interesting opportunities that come from something like that. So, right, we've burned through our time as always happens. It was fantastic talking to you. I appreciate wow. you taking the time. Before I let you go, though, I am curious. Uh, what do you imagine, what do you see as some of the most exciting stuff in the near term future? You mentioned before being a little fascinated with modal synthesis. Um, I'm not sure I even know what that is. Okay. But, uh, so, but, you know, tell us a little bit about what you think are some future technologies that are pretty important. Okay. You know, we're, we're at a time where it really feels like everything's been done. In terms of synthesis, if you're right. looking at it in terms of what are the known synthesis techniques and what's been implemented and what's available as a product, it seems like everything's been done. Right. It seems like everything's been modeled. Everything's, you know, all the stuff you I would have read about in Computer Music Journal or something, there's something that can do that on right. the market. Right. So as a designer, it's kind of really, de it can be really depressing. But my... The, w the way I see it is I don't really focus so much on like techniques and stuff. And I think more what kind of sounds aren't possible today. What kind of sounds would be really hard to synthesize today? Mm -hmm. And why, why is that? You know, what's missing that would make it possible to uh, synthesize any, any possible sound theoretically? You know, that's, that, that, that's kind of... Uh, would be my, like my ultimate goal. I see. Sure. Unattain unattainable goal. Something <laughs> you know, maybe maybe in a three hundred years people could do it, but to have a synthesizer that could make any possible sound. Right. And so, in terms of techniques, I I think of techniques that that have more complex data sets, like um, additive synthesis, for example. Modal synthesis is, is like additive synthesis, except it's using filters. Got it. Instead of um, oscillators, basically okay. you have a bank. You have a bank of bandpass filters. Each one is turned tuned to a resonant node okay. of the system you're you're emulating or synthesizing, and then you play sounds through that. I in, see. in 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 that sense, it makes it much more flexible than uh, additive synthesis. Right. Um, because you don't have. I mean, oscillators are kind of rigid. Filters right. are interesting because you can play any sound through the filter. So you get some of the flexibility of additive synthesis in that, uh, you know, you can adjust the frequencies of each oscillator to whatever you want. Mm -hmm. um, so you end up with this complex set of data, you know. There's a bunch of, bunch of parameters in there, and you have to find a way to manage that. And I think those are the kinds of things we'll see more in the future, you know, spectrums, things like that, more than just a, an, an individual parameter that's like a knob. Right. And there's a certain amount of that in absence. I mean, the, the breakpoint envelopes are, to me, that kind of a parameter. You know, yeah. it's, it's yeah. this sort of complex thing that has a certain complex sort of behavior to it, or the waveforms in absence. And uh, this could, could expand into different different things like uh, modal synthesis I think but well very interesting that's that's a great overview and a great some great conceptual ideas well Brian I want to thank you so much for your time it was fabulous talking to you uh, I learned an awful lot about you but also about uh, your journey that was really really great to learn well thanks a lot for having me it was great great talking with you indeed and uh, next time I'm in France, we'll have to go out and share a bottle of wine or something. Yes, definitely. That'd be definitely. awesome. Get in touch. All right. Will do. All right. Thank you so much. And I will talk to you again soon. Thanks. Bye.
Hey, I'm out on the road this weekend, but I just thought I'd uh, give a quick thanks to Brian for the discussion. Great interview, huh? And uh, to thank all of you for continuing listening and for passing the word along. Let other people know about this one. It's pretty interesting because I don't think a lot of interviews have been out there with Brian Clevenger and the guy's amazing. So uh, let's give him a little support, help support my podcast, and just learn more about the people in our art. Thanks a lot, and we'll talk to you soon. Bye.